Maybe you've heard the saying that goes, well, a little something like this. We tend to find fault in others while making excuses for ourselves. Have you ever heard this statement before? You should have because, well, I've talked about it in the past. And one of the reasons I bring this up and then one of the reasons why I'm, I'm mentioning this is because in cognitive psychology, we actually have a term for this behavior. It's called attribution error. And here's what you need to know. Attribution error is the tendency to be harder on other people than we are on ourselves. Have you ever noticed we can be harder on other people than we can be on ourselves? For example, maybe you have a coworker who has this habit of coming to, to work late. Anybody got one of those coworkers that has this habit of coming to work late? Okay, some of us have been there. So your coworker comes to church late, and you, not church, I'm sorry, to work late. I'm so happy to be back in church. I keep saying church. Your coworker keeps coming to work late. And you look at them and you think to yourself, I know why you're late. You're late because you're out partying all the time or you're too lazy to get out of bed. That's why you're late to work all the time. It's because you're lazy and you're irresponsible. But then you're late for work. And it's not like you're ever going to go to the mirror and say, listen, you need to smarten up. You need to get your act together because you're lazy and you're irresponsible. We don't do that. Oh, no, no, what we do is, you know what, I was late to work because I was up all night taking care of my kids, or I was up all night, you know, working on that project, or, you know what, my, my, my alarm didn't go off, or I was stuck in traffic. You see, you're late because you're lazy and irresponsible, but I was late because I'm responsible, and, well, I'm a victim of my circumstances. You see, attribution error, it's the tendency to find fault in others. Well, we make excuses for ourselves. Now, here's the thing. We do this politically as well. I mean, this is why you will hear some people say, those liberals, they're corrupt. That's why they always do what they do. They're corrupt and they're immoral. Oh, those conservatives, oh, they're hard-hearted, and that's why they do everything they do. They're hard-hearted and they're immoral. And here's the thing. The reason we do this is because it's the natural tendency of the human heart to find fault with those we disagree with. And politicians exploit this. Politics divide us knowing that this is how we behave. Now here's the thing. I expect this from the world. For those who walk according to the flesh, I fully expect the world to behave this way, but when it's the church, that's another thing. You see, the reason I've been preaching this message is because I'm seeing the tactics of politics coming into the arena of the church, and it ought not to be so. I am seeing Christians today more than we ever have. Now, we've always had disagreements, but today we are fault-finding, criticizing, labeling, and demonizing those who disagree with us on a level we've never done so before. And in the church of Jesus Christ, this ought not to be so. So here's what you need to know. Mature Christians don't play this game. Mature Christians do not look at other people who differ with them and say, the reason you're differing with me is because you're bad, you're evil, or you're stupid. You see, the mature Christian understands that people are going to differ with me. And the reason people will differ with me is because, well, the forces that help to shape you are not the forces that help to shape me. In other words, the mature Christian can disagree politically, love unconditionally, and still strive for unity. I loved this cartoon when I first saw it. Here it is. This is Bob. He votes Republican. This is Bob's friend, Sally. She votes Democratic. Bob and Sally are still friends because Bob and Sally are both adults. Be like Bob and Sally. Now, I like this because Bob and Sally are not only mature adults, but I'd like to guess that they are mature Christians. And you see, as mature Christians, we are called to live this truth right here. It's Galatians 6 and 2. Share each other's burdens, and in this way, obey the law of Christ. Now, if you're a note-taker, here's what you need to know. To bear another person's burdens means that what affects you, it affects me. You see... Bearing another person's burdens does not mean I'm over here and you're over there, and, and, and when I see that you're in trouble or you have a need, I stay here and I wish you well, 
thoughts and prayers going out, but I don't lift a single finger to help you. Let me tell you something. That is not love. That is neglect, and it is a sin. When I bear another person's burdens, I am over here, they are over there, and when I see they have a need or they're in trouble, I go to where they are, and we are in this together until you can manage on your own. Now, why would we behave this way? Because of the law of Jesus Christ. Because the law of Jesus Christ says to love one another as I have loved you. And and this love, this love for one another, it means that I have your best interests at heart. I want what benefits and blesses you. Now, if that sounds a little familiar, maybe it's because this is how we define love here at Nepean. You see, love is the giving of yourself for the spiritual betterment and benefit of another human being. And that means I'm going to love you so much, I'm going to be invested in your good so much, that what divides us does not matter, what unites us is imperative. Now here's the thing. It's the law of Jesus Christ that unites us, because politics never will. I mean, think about this for a moment. We've been doing politics for thousands of years, and not once has politics ever benefited us. Not once has politics ever united us. We have tried monarchies, oligarchies, federations, and republics. We've tried popes and tribunals and inquisitions. We've tried dictators and fascists, and now we're trying democracy, socialism, and communism. And during the French Revolution, they even tried anarchy. And all of these political systems have failed us, and they have never united us. Which is why we as Christians here at the Seventh-day Adventist Church will always put our biblical theology ahead of our political ideology. And why? Because the kingdom of Jesus Christ is not of this world. And because the kingdom of Jesus Christ is not of this world, I'm going to come to understand that Well, we're not going to tie ourselves to some political party. I mean, we are called by Jesus Christ to be fully committed, first and foremost, to the kingdom of God. And as such, whenever we as Christians align ourselves or try to align our church with a political party, we do the world a disservice. And I hear it all the time. Uh, Well, I'm a liberal because, well, because Jesus said this, and I'm a conservative because Jesus said that, and everybody thinks that if Jesus were here, he would be on their side. So let me be clear. Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, did not come to earth to be a part of your political party. I I want you to understand, you can be a liberal, a conservative, a socialist, or a communist, but please, Do not think that for one moment you're aligning yourself with anything on this planet that even remotely represents the Jesus, the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ said, my kingdom is not of this world. There is only one institution, one organization on this planet that represents the kingdom of Jesus Christ and it is the church and not the state And God designed that, not men. Jesus Christ did not come to submit his kingdom to your political party. He came to replace it, not submit to it. And as such, we as Seventh-day Adventist Christians need to come to terms with this reality right here. First and foremost, we are called to be an ambassador of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And this means at some point you're going to have to come to terms with the fact that you're going to have to call out sin even in your own political party. You see, when you have to choose between two evils, as an ambassador of Jesus Christ, you call out evil on both sides. When when you have two imperfect political candidates, you call out the imperfections on both sides because wrong is wrong, and as a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, you don't get to turn a blind eye to to the sins of your political party. You are called to call out sin when and wherever it exists, and that means before you ever point out the sin in that political party, you have to deal with the beam in the eye of your own political party. Before you go after the speck in mine, you've got to go after the speck in yours. In other words, 
You have to deal with the stink in your own camp before you deal with the stench in mine. And make no mistake, make no mistake, our political systems, our political systems, well, let me put it to you this way. If you want to be an ambassador to your political party, it'll take guts. It'll take courage. It will take nerves of steel, and it will require a backbone. And why do I say that? Well, because darkness hates the light. And I'm telling you that Christians, the early Christian church, lost their lives being ambassadors for the Lord Jesus Christ. And here's why. It's John 3, 19 and 20. And the judgment is based on this fact. God's light came into the world. But people loved the darkness more than the light, for their actions were evil. And all who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it, for the fear their sins will be exposed. Now, Jesus said this. This is what will happen if you let your light shine. Then you will be arrested, persecuted, and killed. You will be hated all over the world because you are my followers. And then Paul promised this in 2 Timothy, and it's 3 and 12. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Now understand, there are going to be times when the mission of the kingdom of Jesus Christ will intersect with the interests of your political party. But understand, God's kingdom is not of this world. And that means at some point, the kingdom of Jesus Christ is going to clash with your political party, and on that day, you have a decision to make. Will you, will you lift up the interests of your political party, or will you be an ambassador for the Lord Jesus Christ, because the time is coming when you can't be both? The church has always been at odds with the world. Back in the day, Christians lost their lives because they refused to give unyielding loyalty to the state. Because they understood that their first commitment was to the Lord Jesus Christ. And the church has always been at odds with the world. As a matter of fact, we have always challenged the status quo. And how did we do that? Well, we did it through something called disruptive unity. What's disruptive unity? Well, it's actually based on this passage here. It's Galatians 3, 26, 27, and 28. And this passage changed the world. Here it is. For you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ like putting on new clothes. There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, in a world based on dividing people in order to control them, this was radical. I mean, what do you mean that there's a kingdom out there where you cannot divide people because of their race, their gender, their wealth, or their family status? You mean to tell me there's a people out there who love each other so much you can't divide them? This was unheard of. This is a kingdom that could not be beat. And this kingdom, it was a threat to the empire then, and it's a threat to the empires now. Uh, let me explain. It challenged three, three, well, self-evident truths of the day. You mean to tell me that Jews, Gentiles, I mean, Romans and Greeks are all equal? I mean, back in the day, it was self-evident. Well, the Jews, they were a superior race, well, because they were the children of God. And the Greeks thought that it was self-evident. They were the superior human race because everybody spoke Greek. And the Romans thought that it was self-evident that they were the superior race because they conquered the children of God and the Greeks. And for them, it was so self-evident that they were superior to everybody else. And you mean to tell me, there's a kingdom out there where everybody, Jews, Romans, and Greeks are equal? I mean, how are you supposed to conquer and oppress and rule over others if you are not superior to them? But that's not all. You mean to tell me there's a kingdom out there where slaves are equal to their masters? Because back in the day, it was very self-evident that masters had more value than slaves. But you're telling me, in this kingdom, the slave is equal to the master. 
You mean to tell me that in this kingdom, the slave is equal to Caesar? That in this kingdom, the slave will be first and Caesar will be last? I mean, how can we exploit other human beings and become wealthy if they are equal in value to me? But that wasn't all. You mean to tell me there's a kingdom out there where women are equal to men? I, I mean... You're going to tell me that, that, that women, I mean, it's so self-evident that men have more value than women and you're here to tell me women are equal to men and that God is going to judge men based on how they treat the women in their lives? I mean, how in the world is a man supposed to govern and rule over his wife if she's equal to him? Galatians 3, 28, changed the world because now you had a kingdom in which God defined sin based upon how you treated another human being. In God's kingdom, you could no longer conquer and oppress people who were not your race, not your kind, not your religion, not your type. In this new kingdom, employers would be judged on how they treated their employees and that you could no longer exploit your employees in order to make yourself rich. And in this new kingdom, God would judge men for how they treated women. That in this new kingdom, women were daughters of God, created in His image. Women were joint heirs with Jesus Christ, and they are a part of the royal priesthood, and God will judge men based on how they treated women. I don't understand why more women are not Christians because Christianity elevates women to a status that no other religion does. Only in Christianity are women equal to men across the world religions. The kingdom of Jesus Christ would define sin and evil based on how one human being treated another. So when it came to things like racism, inequality, injustice, and the exploitation of other human beings, God would call that sin. And do you know why? Because human lives matter to God. Black lives, indigenous lives, white lives, Indian lives, I mean, abor you know, aboriginals and, 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 well, Belarusian lives matter. I've been hearing that one lately. And, and you know what? Blue lives matter and children's lives matter and Asian lives matter because people matter to God. And in the kingdom of Jesus Christ, all are equal or none. And the kingdom of Jesus Christ is for everybody or it is for nobody. And this message of equality changed the world as we know it. As a matter of fact, it changed the world so much so, it caught the attention of the Roman Empire. As a matter of fact, there was this governor. His name was Pliny the Younger, and he was the governor of what I believe is called Plithynia. Now, I, 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 I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, because Roman names, well, that's all Greek to me. Um, but I, 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 he, he's a governor. And what he's doing is he's looking around his state, he's looking around his city, and he notices something. The pagan temples are empty. Nobody's coming and worshiping Caesar. Nobody's offering up prayers to Caesar or incense to Caesar or even sacrifices to Caesar. And this was tantamount to treason. And Pliny can't figure out why worship of Caesar in his city is basically coming to an end. And then he realizes it has something to do with those Christians who love each other as they, as God loved them. And so he decided he was going to find out what this group of Christians were all about. And so he goes undercover and he attends a Christian worship service. And this is what he wrote. They were accustomed to meet on a fixed day before dawn and sing responsively a hymn to Christ as to God. Now do you know which day of the week this was? It's the Sabbath. Now listen to what was happening next. And they were there to bind themselves by oath, not to some crime, but not to commit fraud, theft, or adultery, not falsify their trust, nor refuse to return a trust when called upon to do so. In other words, what Pliny had discovered was that Christians were committed to this idea that we do not exploit other human beings legally, financially, sexually, or politically. 
that in the kingdom of Jesus Christ, I am equal to you, you are equal to me, and that the religion of Jesus Christ is to do no harm. And in the Roman kingdom, this was unheard of. I mean, how do you get ahead if you can't exploit people? I mean, exploitation was how we became wealthy. In Rome, exploitation was how you had power. In Rome, exploitation was how you had control. I mean, the Roman Empire was based upon and maintained its power through the exploitation and oppression of other human beings. The Roman gods didn't care how you treated other people as long as they got what they want. But in the kingdom of Jesus Christ, You now had a God who would judge you based on how you treated other human beings, and the world had never seen anything like it. For the ruling class of Rome and Greece, this was horrifying. I mean, they worshipped war. They worshipped control. They worshipped power. I mean, these were the tools they used to oppress, separate, and, and control other human beings. And you're telling me that your God judges what I worship, your God will judge what I value? I I mean, think about it. If everybody became a Christian in the Roman Empire, I mean, who would fight your wars? Who would collect your unjust taxes? I mean, who would enslave people for you? If I loved you and you loved me, and, and we're all in this together, and I'm carrying your burdens, well, then who's going to do the dirty work of oppressing other people when we're so busy loving one another? And the kingdom of Rome was brought to its knees, not by politics, but by the law of Jesus Christ, which said, bear one another's burdens. Love each other as I have loved you. It was the most radical message in the world then, and it's a radical message even for today. Now, why do I say that? Because you and I still live in a world where politics is rooted and centered in the idea of power and control and the exploitation of other human beings. Here's what you need to know. The world like God never changes. It only becomes more sophisticated. And if you don't believe me, then you have to ask yourself, how is it today that the rich are still getting richer and the poor are getting poorer? Have you noticed this? So how is it under every political system we have ever devised, including democracy, socialism and communism, how is it under every economic and political system we have ever devised the rich keep getting richer and the poor keep getting poorer and the rich continue to control the poor? Because every single political system on this planet has failed us. And they always will. The world never changes. It just gets better at exploitation. So let me ask you, why should we as a church allow the politics of the world to divide us when the law of Jesus Christ can unite us? Now I understand there are some people out there right now and they're listening to me in this series, they're listening today, and you might be upset. And I get it and I'll tell you why. Because we still have some serious issues facing us in this world today. We, we still have racism, injustice, inequality, and the exploitation of human beings. These are very real, very serious issues. And there are some of you here today who've been affected by this or you love somebody and they're being affected by it. And I understand what's going on in the world right now. Everybody is looking to politicians to solve these problems. But I'm telling you, politics do not solve the problem of sin. It takes a savior. And you can align yourself. I mean, you can become a liberal or a conservative socialist or communist, and you can do that, but please understand that your political party will never resolve or solve the issue of sin that requires a savior, which is why Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, did not come as a king, he came as a lamb, because he came to redeem us from the very systems that oppress us. And so that's why here at the Nepean Seventh-day Adventist Church, we are always going to choose the law of Jesus Christ. In this church, we are going to choose, and I pray 
that today you walk out of here or, or you walk away this Sabbath and you were determined in your heart that I'm going to carry somebody else's burden. I am going to choose to love you the same way Jesus loved me. And that means whatever divides us must diminish and our unity must become imperative. Because of the law of Jesus Christ, I am choosing today to love you so much so that if you differ with me, I won't care if you're a liberal or a conservative. I'm going to love you because the law of Jesus Christ compels me. The kingdom of Jesus Christ is not on the left or a right. It is from above. And because it's from above, it will always unite us because it will unite us in love. I pray that that kingdom will come and it will come today in this church. Amen.